my friends. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom, and the color cast is on the air now from CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It is Monday night, the 15th of June, 1998. June is almost half gone already. Our friend Frank Sinatra Jr. is here tonight after his father passed away here about six weeks ago. And the writer Roy Blount Jr. as well, and you on the toll-free line. In my lifetime, I never met Frank Sinatra. I saw him three times, uh, once at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas in concert, the other time at the Universal Amphitheater when he was in concert there, and the third time was back in 1963 when Frank Jr. was kidnapped. And he was brought home by his, uh, well, not by the kidnappers, but uh, by a police car, actually not a police car, but a private uh, security service in Bel Air, I believe on the night of December 12, 1963, if my memory is correct. And they brought young Frank home after he had been kidnapped uh, at about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. And I was working at the time for Channel 5 KTLA, and up there at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, it was very, very cold uh, in the hills of Bel Air. And about 2.30, quarter of 3, his release was imminent. And Frank Sinatra came out and addressed the press. I, I, I don't mean he addressed them, but he, he chatted with us briefly for a second. He said, look, I know you're cold, and I appreciate you waiting out here until my son gets home, and I've had, this, uh, I've had some food ordered to be sent up. It should be here so that you get something to eat. About 3.15 in the morning, three chuck, uh, trucks from Chasen's Restaurant roll up with Dave Chasen himself. And they set up a spread in the middle of Nimes Road in Bel Air that was astounding with a steam around of beef and ham and turkey and chicken. I mean, uh, you know, uh, soup to nuts and all the fixings at 3.15, 3.30 in the morning. And around 4 o'clock, this white car from the Bel Air Patrol, the private security service, rolled up the driveway of Mrs. Sinatra's house. And we didn't know it at the time, but Frank Jr. was in the trunk of the car. They brought him home, home that way so he would not attract attention or be seen. And Mr. Sinatra came out, Frank Sr., and said his son was home and that the press would be allowed inside the house after a time after he and his son had chatted and, you know, made their hellos. And we had done all that we could do for KTLA, so I went home. It was about 4.30, quarter of 5. But the next day, in conferring with a colleague, uh, she uh, had gone inside uh, to, to do some interviews after the, uh, after the uh, boy had come home, Frank Sinatra Jr. And she said at one point, one of the female reporters walked past a table and there were two statues. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I was told this by a, a lady who was inside uh, Mrs. Sinatra's home. There were two statues on a, a coffee table or a sidebar. And it was wintertime, as I say, in December, and this lady had a, a, a full coat on with baggy sleeves, and she accidentally knocked a statue over and it smashed on the floor. And everybody was mortified. And as the story was told to me, Mr. Sinatra came over and knocked the other statue on the floor and broke it and said, that's okay, don't worry about it. So that's my little slice of Frank Sinatra Sr.'s life. Uh, his son is here tonight, Frank Jr., with uh, how the family is doing since Mr. Sinatra passed away. Fight, fight. He did the whole show, 76 years old, all right, he did the two, the double show that night, and afterwards I hugged him, I kissed him, I said, you're still a champ, Dad, you still get in there and fight. When the show, you know, tired as he was, the show is over, and 15 armed guys with Uzis come push us out of the way, and a guy comes and grabs Sinatra off the stage, takes him into a limousine with the Prime Minister's car, and they go rushing off with a quadrant of police to some cocktail party or something, and I said, now you see what it's like to be a star, isn't that great? Yeah. He showed up about 2 in the morning, and he looked at me, and he said, Oh, that ouzo. <laughs> <coughs> you know, Tom, I think back through the years. Let me, let me, let me ask you about, about you and, and your dad. Yeah. And the last times that you were with him. I, and you know, I'm not, well, I don't want you to be mauled. I'm not, not trying to make ask. you cry. But the last no. couple of times you were with your dad, what you talked about. What you said to him, what he said to you. I said, how you feeling, champ? He said, I'm doing fine. He said, I'm doing great. He said, I'm sick and tired of everybody trying to make me a helpless invalid, you know? You have to understand, Tom, he was really in no danger of dying until the night on which he died. Mm -hmm. And uh, All the trips to the hospital. Uh, for tests and everything. Right. And I've, I'll tell you, there's a story right there. I went to the hospital one time. We put him in for some tests. Now I go to get him back, bring him home. Now he's all doped up. He's groggy, right? Right. You get him home. Now, if your cameras can see this, you're lit nice and white. Now, here, I've got one half of him, and I'm putting him on his bed. Now, what he sees is right here. Mm-hmm. All okay. right? Okay. He's got the top of my head. The next thing I know, while I'm putting him down, I suddenly feel a hand go... Yeah, pulling at your hair. Ouch! What are you doing that for? He said, is that real? 
I said, of course. What kind of a question is that? He said, oh, I thought for a moment maybe you were one of us. <laughs> uh, he couldn't believe that. He said, how did you arrange that? He said, nobody in this family has hair past 35. I said, well, I won't tell you. He said, well, why don't you get the hell on out of here, too, you know? But that was his reaction. He noticed the top of my head and that I still had a little bit left. This was, this was his attitude. Why was the family so secretive, though, about why he was going to the hospital? Because, you know, the, the, I'll the, tell you why the, it was, the, the curiosity that the media had, I think, was based well, more on love uh, yeah, but, uh, than on trying some, to no, find out uh, something. Some of, some of the media, Tom, right. some of the media. But you remember the others, uh, the tabloids had my father dying once a week for three and a half years. Since 1994, sir. That's about right. And why they do this is for one reason, to sell tabloids. Of course. All right? The objective of such publications is never truth. It's money. If truth ever appears, it's coincidental. But the fact was, every time this would happen, it would be such a thing with, a, with the crowds and everything right. uh, that that was why it was kept as quiet as possible. And not only that, my father, Tom, you've got to remember, was a typical old Italian. He didn't like medicine. He mistrusted doctors, and he hated hospitals, mm -hmm. okay. you know? <laughs> it's that simple. To get him to go to the hospital, he says, oh, no, oh, 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 no, you don't. I'm not going to any hospital. This is his attitude, you know. That's everybody else, but not me. What about when uh, Sammy died? When not Dean good. died? I not good. The last time I did your show was leap night. I was thinking about it. It was February 29th, 1996. Dean had just died, and That's I told right. you all the That's Dean right. Martin stories with him. Dean Martin and he played a nightclub one time years ago. This was the relationship they had. Rumor had it that this nightclub had become more of a liability to the owners than a profit-making potential. Gotcha. And one of them said, I'm afraid they're going to torch this place after we close, all right? So one night they had a crowd, and Dean is waiting in the wings to go on. <laughs> My father's standing next to him. And suddenly the fire marshal shows up. Oh, really? Well, to check, you know, yeah, to make sure the house isn't over. And he's standing there, and Dean went over to him and he said, Hey, pal, it's tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> Dean was, Dean was incredible. I told a story at my father's funeral, I mean, in part of the eulogy, that one day he, in front of the very church his funeral was in, he got a traffic ticket one day about 30 years ago. Who, Frank? Yes. On Santa Monica Boulevard. On Santa Monica Boulevard, he went through a red light or some policemen stopped him, and he went over to see him, he looked at his license, and somebody walking down the street made him in the car. The policeman said, well, this, and he looked up, and there were 600 people standing there, and he said, holy cow, what's going on yeah, here, right? right? Now, Dean goes on the Joey Bishop show that night, the old ABC mm -hmm, Joey sure, Bishop show, sure. right? And all Dean, this hit the news, of course, right? All Dean knew is that it had happened in the afternoon in front of the church. And Joey said, hey, Pally, what was Frank uh, Francis trying to do, start a riot? And Dean said, oh, now Dean had to think fast. He said, oh, no, Pally, Frank was on his way to confession. He found he was short of material. <laughs> Let me take a fast break. With Frank Sinatra, Jr., we'll continue after these messages. When he was accused of being involved with organized crime, what, what did he say about those things to you? I asked him one time about one of those Senate hearings one time, and I said, what is it? What's going on with that? What do they ask you? He said, one of the congressmen said to me, uh, uh, were you or were you not the man who actually was running after the train in the last scene of Von Ryan's Express? I said, this is what they asked you? He said, oh, yeah. That's it. And when he had those altercations, Tom, in those days, it wasn't called the media. I mean, that word hadn't been created right. yet. Yeah. He was young and, you know, quick to temper in those days at the time, and uh, he mellowed out and everything, and it's really, um, it's a thing to, to look back on a man's life through the years. I can remember the times, I think, when did you come from Milwaukee to California? I know you went well, to Well, I New came York from first. Philadelphia, actually, to, right. or from Atlanta to uh, 1963. Right. Well, before that, here, when I was a little boy, Tom, we had a local show on KTLA in those days, the Spade Cooley show. Mm -hmm. Spade Cooley wore the cowboy stuff oh, and played the music the show. Yeah, and I believe show. he went to prison. I think he died in prison for murder or something, if my memory serves me correct. And this was a very fly-by-night show, 1950, 51. 
And one night, I turned on this program. My father was, I was a little boy, and there was my father singing. It was a $50 show because he had lost everything. He had nothing left. He was drawn. And these were the hard times. These were the very, very hard times. He went into movies more, and I, I was thinking about it tonight to tell you that at one point in the old, you were talking about Chasen's Restaurant, which mm -hmm. is no more, the old Chasen's Restaurant on Beverly Boulevard here in town. One night he was in the bar in the 50s, and he went into the men's room, and as he was going in, another man was coming out. And he looked up and recognized it was Boris Karloff, and he said, Mr. Karloff, he said, all my life I've admired you since you scared me to death when I was a kid when you played Frankenstein's monster. You're a marvelous actor. And Karloff blushed and he said, oh, he said, I'm not an impression. He said, you too are a fine actor, young man, but you must learn to act with your voice as well as your face. You're a singer, for you it should be easy. Now they find out, they talk for a minute, they find out their neighbors. So all through the King's Go Forth period, the Some Came Running period, the, in the late 50s, his movies, every time my father would get a script, he'd go over to Karloff's house, and Karloff would read with him. And he was, Boris Karloff started grooming him as to when to hold back on lines mm -hmm. and everything. Most mm -hmm. people, you know, these are stories that no one knows, yeah, Tom. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand what he meant when he said that the senator or the congressman said, well, are you the person who was the last one off the train in Von Rhein? No, no, it's chasing the train. At the end, when he got killed with the machine gun by the German soldier, he was running after yeah, the train. But, but is that what the congressman really asked That's him? what he asked him. That's what he asked. I looked at him, and I asked him the same question. I said, you're putting me on. Is that what they really... He said, that's what they asked me. He when said, you asked what, what, asked. what the hearings that's were all right. about, this that's was right. involving... They uh, wanted to know whether or not it was really me or a stuntman chasing the train at the end of On Ryan's Express. So then they asked him nothing about organized crime? Oh, or... sure they did. Did you ever own this? Well, then he said, no. You know, this kind of thing, the usual stuff. But then, while they were sitting there, I asked him, was he chasing the train yeah. at the end of On Ryan's Express? When you came home that night in December of 63 in the back of the Bel Air Patrol, mm -hmm. and you went inside your mother's house, mm -hmm. what did your dad and mother say to you when you got home that night? What was that scene like? My mother wept bitterly, bitter tears. My mother, Tom, had aged 10 years. I had just seen her just a few weeks before. She had aged 10 years. And my father was very, very edgy, as he had been all along. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that particular point in time, I was immediately whisked into the capable hands of the FBI to give a statement. Of course. I said, I have to do this while I still remember it. And uh, he kind of disappeared. He stayed in the background at that point because he wanted the appropriate agencies to do what it is that they had to right, do. to brief you, find That's out right. what happened to your recollection. That's right. And then they had to take statements from me as to what I remembered, this, that, and the other thing. This took about, I'll bet you it took seven hours the first night which was good because I was able to give them some information. Yeah. That led to the arrest of the people that That's perpetrated right. this crime. That's right. And you will carry on the legend? Uh, you'll go out with the orchestra and sing the songs? I'm still working, you know, still going everywhere.